we're not of this world. Heart work is God's work. These are three enemies of our soul, the world, the flesh, the devil. Protection is available. Jesus has won this fight. Heart work is a battle. Fight is unavoidable. Good morning. What's up, y'all? Woo! Wow. Oh, you know, I love that. You know, it's funny, when I get up here, I, I'm always honored to be able to share. I just love the fact that we can worship together. Come on, y'all. Like, oh, Lord. I, I mean, it is, yeah, this is why we're encouraged to not forsake the assembly. Like, I never want to forsake gathering together. I never want to forsake just, oh, I guess we got to go to church. No, we get to go to church. Come on now. And not only do we get to go to church, but we get to be the church. And today, as the Lord is ministering to us, the heart of God is that he would minister through us. I often say, you know, this is football Sunday, and this is like game time for football players. And quite often as believers, we, we, we look at Sunday as game time. And I just want to remind you, this isn't game time, this is practice. Today, we're going to receive instruction from the Lord on how we are to be his vessel, how we are to be salt and light. And I have the honor of bringing the word today. I want to welcome in Cape Coral. Cape Coral, make some noise. All right. I heard you. No, I didn't. Whew. Hey, uh, I, there's, there's one thing I, I do want to celebrate. Um, you know, in the midst of turmoil in Israel and what's going on there and, and the attack of just Hamas and, and what that has stirred up now and, and really this war that's taking place. I want to celebrate the fact that last week there were two hostages that were released. Praise the Lord. Can we thank God for that? And um, last week you saw a video uh, from Jerusalem Institute of Justice, one of our mission's partners. They're, they're there on the ground. They are an advocacy group, really a group of lawyers uh, who advocate for uh, Jewish believers right there in, in Jerusalem, but also what they've done now that, that wartime has broken out. They have shifted their advocacy efforts specifically to these hostage families and representing them before the United Nations and before the uh, International Red Cross. So thank you, even as Mike was saying in your generosity, there is more as one of the designations that we have. It's just the mission's arm and expression. Uh, of what the Lord wants to do through the local church. And when you give to that, it, it allows us the opportunity to continue to sow into these different places and not only just provide prayer, but provide the resources that are needed to be able to advocate specifically for these families. So thank you for that. And I know, I, I, let me say this too. Some of you maybe say, hey, what, what can we do? Uh, I, I wanna do more. And, and uh, info at Ocean Church, shoot us an email this week and just say, I wanna do more, I don't know what it is. And we wanna take some time with you and, and help just walk with you and say, all right, what does it look like for you to do more in, and engage in this conflict that's taking place as we pray and we trust God with the peace that he's going to bring through Jesus Christ, y'all. Be praying specifically for even for the hostages that they would have supernatural peace in the midst of this chaos. Would you stand with me? I'm gonna be in Ephesians 6, 12, 13, continuing our series in the fight recognizing, and even just stop down, what we're seeing in Israel is, is a spiritual thing. Come on now. Oh, that's right. it's, not a, it's not just a, a physical war. It's not, let me say this too, it's not a dark person versus a light person thing. It, it, it's, not, it's not a political thing. It is a spiritual thing that's taking place. And we recognize here that even in Southwest Florida, we are in a fight ourselves, y'all. There is a war that wages on for our souls. Paul, recognizing this, he's writing to the church of Ephesus, chapter 6, verse 12 through 13. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. Come on, your sibling's not your enemy. Your neighbor's not your enemy. That Republican is not your enemy. That Democrat is not your enemy. Joe Biden's not your enemy. Come on now. Someone tell you, hey now, come on, saints. Y'all better stop. <laughs> All right. 
It's not against flesh and blood enemies, against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Another translation says principalities. Therefore, everybody say therefore. Therefore. Put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Let's pray one more time. Bow your heads. Father, enlighten us today. Open the eyes of our heart to not only see the, the, the places of spiritual attack, the, the places that the enemy has accessed our life, but God, that we would understand the overwhelming victory that is available for us in Christ Jesus. That's Open right. the eyes of our heart today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go ahead and have a seat and high five somebody as you're sitting down. <laughs> Woo. April, you didn't high five, high five somebody, babe. <laughs> she high fived herself. Whoo! Speaking of my wife, how many of y'all got pet peeves? <laughs> so, like, or, um, you know, y'all have maybe a sibling, a, a brother or sister that, like, does something and you're like, I can't stand it, right? Like, why do they do this? Like, my, my older sister, when growing up, hopefully she's not watching this, she, uh, she would eat, like, aggressively slow, and it would drive me nuts. So why do you do that? Just eat your food. And, you know, the pet peeve, some of us, we have it with our spouses. And um, I'll tell you, I know she has a pet peeve of, of, for me. You know, I like to think I'm a person of order or maybe cleanliness and like the things to be in order. And, and, but one of the things that I do that drives her nuts is I leave my socks on the floor. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why I do that. It's just for whatever reason, like I sit on the sofa, I'm like, I'm ready to take my socks off and I'm not going to get up and put them somewhere. Like I'm going to take them off right here. But one of the things that my wife does that drives me crazy and she knows this already uh, is that she leaves the cabinet doors in the kitchen open. Hey now, come on. I'm like, I'm like, babe, shut those doors. Do you realize a fly can fly into the door and, and, and fly in and, and into our our, our cookware and they can lay eggs and have little babies and then they grow up and now you got grandparent flies and parent flies and, and you got a whole generation and lineage of flies in there simply because you couldn't shut the door. <laughs> I go so extreme, right? <laughs> Leaving the cabinet doors open. The message, the title of my message today is Open Doors. Cape Coral Online, if you're taking notes, write that down. Open doors. We see conflict in the, in the Middle East. We see the conflict internally, the things that wage war with our flesh, the things that wage war with our soul. And I'll start by saying this, that no military goes to war without a goal or a strategy. There's an objective in the attacks that you face in life, there is an objective, and the enemy of our soul has an objective. And the strategy, part of the strategy of the world, the flesh, and the devil, Pastor Josh, we've been talking about this and identifying the three enemies, the world, the flesh, the devil, and the angle for all of them is to infiltrate our lives. Let me give you a definition of that word, infiltrate. It's, it's often a, a, a term that's associated with warfare. It's kind of like uh, behind enemy lines or a mole, some, somebody that, that sneaks in unknowingly. This definition of infiltrate is to enter or become established in gradually or unobtrusively, usually for subversive purposes, to infiltrate our lives. We all get to these places where we recognize the place of spiritual attack we feel, a place of oppression. And I'll just step down and aside real quick, stop down for a second. There's, and I won't spend too long into this, but there's, there's debate on whether or not a believer can be possessed or oppressed. And, and here, here's what scripturally I, I understand to be a reality is that a follower of Jesus, someone that has been filled with the Holy Spirit cannot be possessed. But what we see scripturally is that we all can feel oppressed. We all experience suffering. We all experience heartache. And I want to give you a thought right off the rip here is that when it comes to spirituality, when it comes to principalities, when it comes to spirits, there are no neutral spirits. 
There are no, it's not like there's God, good spirits, then there's just some in the middle that are like agnostic, and then there's like really evil, ah, with fang spirits. Come on now. Like there are forces of heaven and there are forces of hell. There's, there's nothing in between there. There's no spirit of Casper in there. Come on, somebody. Like <laughs> Casper, the friendly ghost, young people, y'all know about Casper? No, right? Yeah, you do? All right. Well, all right. There are forces of heaven and hell. Like that's it. Like they, they, there is no like, like all the, the good spirits and, and, and all this stuff. And I want to give you three doors that are access points for spiritual attack. And there are probably more, but these are three that I felt the Lord gave me and I identified. Again, we're trying to understand, we get to these places in life and like, why do I feel these different, this angst? Why do I feel fearful? Why do I feel such shame? Why do I feel such disappointment? Why do I feel such depression? Why do I feel such anxiety? And, and quite often, it's, it's important. We don't, and quite often, we don't take the time to stop and say, okay, are there, is there anything that I've allowed to be entered into my life or where has the enemy had access in my life? And the first door that I want to tell you about is the door of unforgiveness. There you go. Jesus was so severe in the teaching on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, which we'll look at in a, a second, he was so severe about us recognizing the need, the necessity for forgiveness, for not just receiving forgiveness, but giving forgiveness. Forgiveness leads to bitterness. Bitterness is the fruit of unforgiveness. Hebrews says this, the writer in, in chapter 12, Hebrews 12 14 through 15, in the ESV, it says, strive for peace with everyone. Say everyone. everyone. And for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no what? Root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it become defiled. The NLT says it like this. I love it. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. You know, I think about Cain. You know, God said, you know, Cain, where's your brother Abel? Abel Cain was like, am I my brother's keeper? Like, hey, there's, there's a reality that we are as, as followers of Jesus to look after one another, recognizing is there what is defined here, is there a poisonous root of bitterness that grows up and causes trouble causes trouble, that troubles you, and it corrupts many. And so often we look at unforgiveness as something that we're like, I can't release, I can't forgive somebody for something, because if I do, then they'll get away with it, right? Like, they haven't apologized yet. I'll forgive them when they apologize. And you, you may be waiting an awfully long time. And in that process, what it's doing, it's, it's poisoning your soul. You've heard it said like this, is that holding unforgiveness in your heart is like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. Or that holding unforgiveness in my heart, I'm not going to release them. It's giving somebody power. It's like locking yourself in prison and giving someone else the key. Unforgiveness in our heart. And not only are we at risk of developing a root of bitterness... We run the risk of God himself holding a charge, of a, a charge against us when we hold on to unforgiveness. Matthew 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, again, Jesus is saying this. He says, if, and this is Jesus coming off the heels of, you know, they, the disciples are saying, hey, we want to learn how to pray. Jesus leans into the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Very next verse, he says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Woo! Like, let me say this. Forgiveness, is, it's not an option for those of us that are followers of Jesus. It's not an option. It's a requirement. Can I get an amen right there? It's a requirement. How can we expect God to forgive us and we won't forgive somebody else? 
You say, well, Phil, you don't know what this person did to me. You say, you're right. But I, what I do know is that God forgave us. And I'll just give you a little equation as unforgiveness leads to bitterness. Bitterness left unchecked leads to oppression. I put loneliness there because I, I really feel like that's one, of, that's one of the strategies in warfare is isolation. Ooh, let me just say this. What was so demonic about COVID-19, what was so demonic about that time period, what was so, it was so aggressively demonic is that people were left isolated. And this is the place, it is the pouncing ground for the enemy. And when we, help, when we hold on forgiveness in our heart, it's like we, 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 put a fortify, we put fortified walls around our heart and we said, no, we're not gonna let anybody in that can ever hurt me again. And sadly, what happens is we don't let anybody in, period. So the door of unforgiveness, the second door, which I'll maybe take a little bit more time in, is the door of mammon. How many have heard that term, Mammon. Right, it's like a kind of a, a churchy word, a churchy term. And I grew up going to church, and I, and I grew up, and I, I didn't really learn about the door of mammon. And even in my my adult life, I didn't learn about the god of mammon, and that's what it's referred to. The Babylonian people worshipped the god of mammon. It was known as a, a really a, a god of of, uh, of the love of money. And there's two two places I want to point you to that are wrapped in mammon. And if you're taking notes, write this down in Cape Coral. Pay attention. This is the definition of mammon. False provision. It's not just money. It's false provision. Anything that you derive your power, hope, and, and, and joy from, a purpose from, false provision. And there are two areas I want to point you to. One is the occult, and one is the love of money. But first, the occult. How many have heard that term? Again, there are no neutral spirits. Y'all... Uh, I remember growing up and they had this thing called a Ouija board. Is that like still a thing? It, uh, it, there, it, it was a demonic board game that you start entertaining demonic spirits. But here's what the occult, just a definition. I'm going to give you some different definitions today. The occult, what it means is matters regarded as involving the action or influence of supernatural or supernormal powers or some secret knowledge of them. Now, I'm going to say some things right now, and here's what I want you to know. Y'all know, whether it's me, Pastor Josh, anybody that holds this platform, Pastor Jim, you are never going to receive condemnation from this platform. For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You're not going to receive condemnation from us. We're, we're not going to get, and, and even conviction, that's the Holy Spirit's part. Like, we're, we're not here to try to convict you. Like, that, that's not my role. Like, that's not, that's not the role of a pastor. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. I'm not built like that. Amen. But here's what I want to share with you. Like, we have to be so aware of the spiritual realities around us. We live in a time where there is a hyper fascination of spirits, not just embracing, but celebrating them. And y'all on October 31st, again, this is not condemnation. Like we're, we're doing the trunk or treat thing in Cape as, a, as an act to say, we want to be light to the community. This is an opportunity where people are leaving their houses anyway. So, so I get that. But like, y'all, some of, some of the realities of this time period is a celebration of fear. And like y'all, and I'm in it, y'all. Like I, and like I get it. Some of it is cute, right? Like I, I get it. Like I remember one of the the my my parents that I wanted to dress up for Halloween when I was like five or six years old, and 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 they they, they I was a transformer. Hey now, like I was a transformer, y'all. And my parents wrapped tin foil around my legs. <laughs> I'm dead serious. They wrapped me in tin foil. That was my costume, y'all. <laughs> it's cute. Oh, I can't wait for my mom and dad to watch this. Ooh. But it's, as I, I go and I'll, I'll run through the neighborhood, I'll walk through the neighborhood, and, and, and I'm amazed and uh, amazed and, and, and a little bit enraged. Like, uh, one of the Halloween decorations I saw, it was a body that was cut in half and its head was hanging by a noose. Y'all, that's not cute. 
I saw, I saw a decoration. It was a, it was a, a dead body. It was, a, it was like a lifeless kind of like figure, a dead body laying on, on, a, on, a, on someone's lawn with blood dripping out of it. Y'all, that's not cute. I saw, I saw uh, it was a, a, a decoration of a baby sitting on a chair with a hole in his head. Y'all, that's not, y'all, that's not cute. We have to be aware. Y'all get what I'm saying? Yeah. Embracing fear. And not just embracing fear, but when it comes to the occult, embracing alternative ways to provision. Alternative ways to peace and fulfillment. How many have heard the term new age? Right? You ever heard a term? It's kind of one of those terms that can be really ambiguous. And depending on who you talk to, they'll throw a bunch of stuff in there and they say that's new age. But here's another definition. Again, this isn't scripture, but it's just a definition to give you a picture of what false provision looks like. New age religiosity is typified by its eclecticism. This is from Wikipedia. Generally believing that there is no one true way to, spirit, to pursue spirituality. New Agers develop their own worldview. Anybody hear that term, my truth? Whoo! Bad news, y'all. By combining, look at this. They, they develop their own worldview by combining bits and pieces to form their own individual mix. Seeking what they called a spirituality without borders. Y'all were seeing this today. But here's the thing. Even Pastor Josh alluded to it. Like that there aren't like multiple ways to get to God. Jesus said it like this. I am the way, the truth, the life. And then he says, no one. Everybody say no one. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. Here's, there's only one way to God. This thought that there are more than one, there's more than one way to heaven. There's more than one way to peace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is what we call pseudo peace, temporary peace, false peace. It's not everlasting peace. Jesus being identified as the what? The Prince of Peace. One more term I'll give to you, because I'm like just stepping all over your toes, I know. This term witchcraft. Hmm. Who y'all, it's, it's not cute. Y'all, it's not cute. The exercise or invocation of alleged supernatural powers to control people or events practices typically involving sorcery or magic. Y'all, some of this stuff, some of this stuff, y'all, listen to me, y'all. Uh, look at this precious one on the front row. Some of these, these kids can't understand the difference in the spiritual realities that are going on around them. And it's our job to be aware, not to be ignorant, not to celebrate and embrace a spirit of fear. For we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. We've been given power by God to overcome the devil. We've been given love by God to overcome the world, and we begin self-control to overcome our flesh. Whoo, that's good preaching, y'all. All right, mercy clap. Y'all, when we look to anything, when we look to horoscopes, to try to define us, when we look to personality tests to try to define us, when we look to crystals to be our source of power and inspiration, when we eliminate the need for Jesus as our source, we are at risk of embracing a spirit of man. And today we're going to have an opportunity at the end of, end of service to renounce a spirit of man. And the second thing, well, before I move on to the love of money and talking about that, uh, the, the end result quite often of when we allow something else to replace God is we embrace the spirit of fear. So Adam and Eve in the garden, where do we see fear taking place? When does fear enter into the world? We see Adam and Eve, they, they entertain the serpent and the serpent wasn't questioning God's goodness he wasn't questioning God's power and, and all that was available to them. 
But what he was doing is he was questioning God's provision. And the end result of Adam and Eve says that their eyes were opened and that they saw that they were naked and they hid. And God came in the garden. He said, yo, Adam. He didn't say it like that, but he might have. He said, Adam, where are you? Genesis 3.10, he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. He was afraid. Let's not celebrate fear, y'all. Love of money. 1 Timothy 6, Timothy's receiving instructions for leading the church. Again, the God of mammon associated with the love of money. But godless, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world. And we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire, check this, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Look at this. For the love of money, not money, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. That, just, that, that word just means sorrows. The love of money. I was talking to somebody in between service and they said, Phil, uh, I saw a statistic that, that said that only 35% of people in Naples identify themselves to be Christians. That means there is 65% of people living in Naples. I mean, I would, let's just expand that out to the greater Southwest Florida area that don't identify God as their source. We see the spirit of mammon alive and well in southwest Florida. Can I just be as bold to say that? Where, uh, where people, and, and I love living here, I love it. The, the palm trees, the sunshine, whoo, it's like paradise. But quite often, people work themselves to a place of retirement. They have trusted their skills. They've relied on their ability and their acumen and their ability to make money and to build wealth and invest. And they rely on their nest egg. And they have millions of dollars. And they say, I have all the provision I need, sir. And they embrace this place. Jesus says it like this, Matthew 6, 24, I'll, I'll read it again. No one can serve two masters. I've heard it said like this about money, and I, and I love teaching on personal finance. Like I, my background's in finance. I, I, I think it's important that we're good stewards of, of the resource God gives us, amen? Like, like we need to be good stewards of it. But I heard it said like this too, that money uh, makes a terrible master, but it makes a great servant. See, the problem isn't you having money. It's about money having you. And this is why I, oh, man. I'll, I'll finish the verse out. He says, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. This is the ESV translation. says, you cannot serve God and money. And one of the things I used to teach uh, when it comes to personal finance and money, and one of my contemporaries t t teaches this and says this all the time. It says that, like, money is amoral. Meaning like it, it, it's, it's neutral, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not good or it's not bad. And like there, there's some truth to that, but here's what I've recognized. All money, not, not cash, not like US dollars versus like, you know, British pounds. Like all money and what it represents, it has a spirit on it. Come on. And this is what Jesus is speaking to. This idea of mammon, false provision. This is why y'all, our money needs to be redeemed. <clears throat> Y'all, we don't, we don't tithe as believers and followers of Jesus. We don't practice tithing. We don't give so we can build buildings. That's not why we give. Hey, now. That's a byproduct. That's not why we do it. We don't tithe just because, oh, it's a, it's a nice thing to do. It's a nice, a nice thing to give back and to give to the needy. No, no, no. We tithe to break the curse of mammon off of our life, to say that, God, this, I'm going to not only give you my first, but I'm going to give you the best portion. We, we think in terms of, of dollars and cents, but agriculturally speaking, and, and what these uh, believers had was bringing the first fruit of your increase, the cream of the crop, bringing the first part out of the ground and saying, Lord, you've blessed me, and because you've blessed me, I'm going to give you this to say that whatever this is, whether it's crops or resource, that it is not going to have a hold on me. 
I remember when I stepped into ministry and I left finance. Oh my God, I'm running out of time. When I, when I stepped out of working in finance and I stepped into ministry eight years ago, I felt the Lord say this as I was wrestling with it because I was in ministry previously and got involved in finance. And I felt the Lord say this to me. I said, Phil, if you trust me in this, you will always have more than enough. Because how many know it takes a lot of faith to leave finance and to step into ministry? Oh, Lord. We had just had a new baby, and, and the, one of the partners at the firm was like, we, you, you just had a kid, and you're going to go work for a church? And I said, yep. <laughs> so he said, you'll always have more than enough. And he said, if you stay here in this world in finance, you'll never feel like you have enough. And y'all, the love of money can lead us to that place of desiring provision from somewhere other than God. Deuteronomy 8.18, for it is God who gives you the power to get wealth in the first place. The last door real quick, the door of despair. This is a door that most of us haven't opened ourselves. You, the door of despair for you is you, your father walked out and you, you have these emotional, mental ailments that you've been dealing with, the place of rejection. The door of despair looks like you losing a loved one a loved one passing away. You didn't cause that to happen. As a child or as a, as a student, a teacher said something to you that was messed up and it's set the course of your life in a terrible way. And this door of despair has opened up to us and you know we see the rise of addictions in America because of the doors of despair that go unaddressed. And let me just say this about addiction, is that addiction is, this is all, this is all it is. Listen, because y'all, some, some countries get this right, some, some, some churches get this right, and some churches get this wrong, but addiction is pain management, y'all. It's pain management. The only one, listen, the only one who can heal the only one who can fix the broken door of despair is Jesus Christ himself. John 10, he says, I am the door. Jesus said this, he said, I am the door. How do you deal with the open doors that, you've, that the enemy has used in your life and you feel oppressed? How do you deal with those doors? How, how do you shut those and deal with them? You, you, can't, you can't deal with them on your own. You literally have to take the door off of the hinges and you put the door, Jesus Christ himself, as the governor and the entrance point to your life. Would you stand with me? Everybody in Cape, would you stand as well? Quite often, we, uh, we pray a prayer of salvation. We say, hey, well, you want to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, and we hit the salvation piece. There's something in this fight. Battles are won and lost, typically, even in old times, by the king's ability to properly strategize. And the place of Lord, I want to invite you to a place of lordship today accepting Jesus as your Lord. We say cute things like, Jesus be my co-pilot, Jesus take the wheel, and, that, and that's cool. But, but, but I'm saying that you, you cannot win the battle without Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen. That's right. Oppression, depression, anxiety. You can get a lot of great, there's a lot of great psychological tools out there, but principalities don't respond to good ideas. Principalities only respond to princes. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Would you bow your heads? Father, I pray today that this wouldn't just be another good message. Lord, that this is just not something of good information to tuck away into our notebooks. But God, this is a place to accept the invitation to freedom that you are calling us to. God, to take up the weapons of our warfare. But God, there are things we've been carrying around that are heavy. And God, I thank you that you're inviting us right now, whether it be unforgiveness. God, whether it's the scrapping for resource and feeling like we need to do all we can to climb to the top. 
of the proverbial ladder, or God, it's the, the places of disappointment and frustration and abuse and addiction. God, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, you would reveal the access points by the enemy, that the enemy is coming. And by the power of your Spirit, you would give us a boldness to deal with them. I want y'all in Cape, I want y'all here in Estero to repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Say, it aloud. Say it aloud. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Today, Today I, choose I choose to make Jesus, to make Jesus my, Lord. my Lord. God, I renounce unforgiveness. God, I renounce unforgiveness. God, I choose to forgive those that have wronged me. God, I renounce a spirit of mammon over my life. God, I renounce a spirit of mammon over my life. God, today I choose, God, today I choose to, look to, to look to you as the only source, the only source for, hope, for hope, for purpose, for, purpose, for, salvation. for salvation. And God, we renounce. God, we renounce the place of defeat. The place of defeat. Uh, by your power. By your power. We choose today. We choose today to walk in victory. To walk in victory. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Shout amen. Come on, amen. shout amen. amen. Hallelujah.